Hello, everyone. My name is Gitika Gorthy, and today I'm very, very honored and excited to be interviewing a very special Spanish champion again, uh, Dr. George Neal, who I interviewed last year. And Dr. Neal uh, recently went on a flight, a commercial flight on Blue Origins New Shepard, and I'm so excited to kind of break down how his journey and experience in space went. Uh, for those who may not know, Dr. Neal is the president of Commercial Space Technology LLC, which he founded to encourage, facilitate, and promote commercial space activities. He previously served as associate administrator for the Federal Aviation Administration Office of Commercial Space Transportation and res was responsible for licensing and regulating all commercial launch activities. I am so excited to really hear how his journey to space went and how that training was. I saw it all on social media and it looked very exciting. So thank you so much, Dr. Neal, for taking your time to you know, talk to us about your journey a little bit more. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me on. It was quite a day, quite a week, really. Yeah, you know, I have to start off with a question, which was, you know, being 62 miles above Earth and floating in zero G, what was the experience and finally, like the feeling finally like for you? So I've been asked that a lot and the answer is, <laughs> it was awesome. It was amazing. It was exhilarating. It was humbling. It was inspiring. It was all of those wrapped wow. into one. And you know, microgravity w was fun and new and interesting, but without a doubt, the, the highlight of the mission was the view. Um, the New Shepard capsule has six seats inside and every seat is a window seat. They have a great big window. And when we went through the launch and the sky starts turning a darker and darker blue, and then all of a sudden, you see the curvature of the earth, a very thin, bright blue line right above it, which is the atmosphere, and the blackest black that you can imagine in the sky. It was, frankly, the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Pictures don't do it justice. Videos and movies <laughs> don't come close. It was just incredible. You know, when you first saw Earth from that perspective, you know, you've only probably seen it in pictures before. What was like your first thought? Did you have like, you know, like, oh, finally I get to see it. Did you have like the overview effect? I mean, did you have any thoughts or were you just speechless at that point of time viewing the beauty of Earth? It's, it's hard to describe. I mean, I, I, was, I was speechless. <laughs> I was stunned. I was yeah. uh, excited. Uh, you know, we were shouting and pointing. And <laughs> Couldn't wow. believe it. Uh, it was just incredible to see that. And so it was It was just a wow moment. Uh, so the, the overall flight was pretty short, only about 10 minutes. And so, you know, was there an overview effect and so forth? Well, you know, maybe in some ways, uh, don't know your experience, but, but certainly uh, my experience is when I read a really good book or I see a movie or a play, it can, it can move me. When I hear some music that is just deep inside you and it stirs something up. So this was all of that and more combined. What you saw, what you heard, what you felt, just the total experience. Yeah, and I think your expressions say it all truly. Um, you look so excited and I can just see the emotions running through you. So I can, you know, definitely imagine how uh, memorable of an experience that really is. So that's incredible. And, you know, when you're coming back down onto Earth, uh, you know, did you? how was it like coming back down? So let, let's start with the, the descent itself. I, I think most people are aware that uh, you're pushed into your seat as you accelerate after launch. And we experienced about, about three Gs or about three times your normal weight uh, for a couple of minutes until main engine cut off or, or Miko. But, but the same thing happens on the way back down with, with the atmosphere pushing against the capsule to slow it down. And so once again, you're pushed back in your seat and you know that caused uh, actually about five and a half Gs for, for just a couple of seconds. Oh, wow. And then that, uh, decreases a little bit and then you hear a big bang as the three drug chutes are deployed and then the three main parachutes and that's pretty much a, a nice smooth ride down from that point. Uh, if you saw the video, 
there was a huge big cloud of dust kicked up at landing. And so it looks like we hit really hard. It really wasn't that hard. Uh, this is the dust from the West Texas desert. And right before we touch down, they fire some retrograde thrusters to slow us down even further. So it's basically just like sitting down hard in your chair, a little jostle and it was over, uh, no wow. discomfort at all. And, and so from that point, you know, how, how did I feel? Well, I, mean, I, I felt joy, I felt laughter, I felt excitement. <laughs> I wanted to go over and give my wife a big hug and then tell everybody about the whole experience. Yeah, yeah, that sounds you know really exciting. I know seeing it from a video, you guys are coming down super fast. And so you would think there would be a lot of impact, but I'm glad to know that it wasn't, you know, it was just, you know, not too bad of an experience. And you know, I'm curious, you probably have always wanted to go to space growing up as a child. And I'm curious, what was this driving factor to you for you to get involved in commercial space activities, uh, you know, as a career and then getting into this commercial space launch? So I've been interested in space uh, my entire life, uh, cut out articles and pictures and made a scrapbook when I was a little boy and all the rest and I wanted to, to learn more about aerospace engineering and to and to fly. Uh, so we did that in, in the Air Force and then uh, applied to be a NASA astronaut at one point. Uh, but although I made the final, didn't make the final cut, um, but still enjoyed working on the space program myself and had other experiences too at uh, private industry and uh, the FAA, of course, working in the Office of Commercial Space Transportation. And I was seeing some really fun things happening in industry with reusable launch vehicles and space tourism and spaceports. And that was really fun and interesting to work on. But uh, when, again, now we, we've got three companies now <laughs> that are selling tickets for people yeah. to go into space, SpaceX, yeah. Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic. And so um, it's finally coming to fruition and that's pretty exciting. Yeah, and you know, could you share with us, um, you know, I've read a lot about the value of commercialization and I'm a huge fan because I think it opens up so many doors to providing more job opportunities, but also increasing accessibility into space overall. But I, I'm, you know, just curious to hear it from you. Why do you think commercial uh, space is so important? So uh, again, it used to be that almost everything that happened in space was being done by the government. And now that is no longer the case. And I think one of the reasons for that is we're seeing that the private industry can, can do things at, at lower cost. They can do things with increased innovation compared to the way the government typically doesn't. I think many companies have a, a, a greater risk tolerance. They're, they're willing to, to try saying not to be unsafe, but to, to allow failure to occur so you can learn from that failure and incorporate modifications in their designs. And then uh, companies have the ability to, to develop and, and offer new products and, and have new customers and new markets. You know, that's not the government's job to do that. And similarly, uh, companies have the ability to raise uh, new sources of funding and investment. Again, the government doesn't look at that. They use tax dollars to do their programs and they get congressional approval and so forth. But uh, this is such an exciting time because we're seeing lots of companies now uh, for a variety of reasons say, hey, this is something we wanna be involved in and whatever their particular mission of learning more about the earth or the universe or selling tickets to people to have that experience, uh, we're, we're seeing all of that take place now. Yeah, and do you think this is kind of the, you know, I don't want to say it's like the pinnacle, but like a really, do you think this is how a commercial space is going to be where it's mostly focused on space tourism? Or do you think there's still a long way in the commercialization of the space industry? And there's still a long way for SpaceX, Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic to you know, take commercialization to another level. Look, what are your thoughts on this? So we, we've seen a lot of progress uh, just in the last uh, nine or 10 months, obviously with the three companies now. <laughs> taking people to space, but I, I don't think space tourism is going to be the sole focus. There's lots of different ways that a space can matter. And uh, again, th these are not uh, big surprises. There's, there's national security implications. There's uh, reasons to want technological leadership in the world community or to have economic competitiveness so that uh, we can uh, have good progress. 
uh, products that, that others would like to have. Um, scientific discovery is still there, uh, exploration, and then inspiring the next generation. All of those are, are great reasons for, for countries and for governments to have space programs. What's new now is both companies and wealthy individuals, frankly, uh, may have their own reasons, which can include some of those, or they think they can make money doing this, or they might just believe in the importance of space to the future. And, and look at some of the examples. Uh, Elon Musk talks about the need for us to be a, a multi-planetary species. Uh, if you listen to Jeff Bezos, he would love to see humanity get all of, of the polluting industries and other heavy equipment and things off the planet so that we can protect and enjoy our life here on Earth more. Um, Richard Branson talks about uh, having a, a global space lines. Again, we can go from one place on Earth to another more quickly, less expensively, and, and that'll hopefully bring us all together as, as a species. So uh, lots of reasons. And some of these people are, are writing their own <laughs> checks and, and making it happen. And there's a lot of people who are interested. Yeah, so many visionary thoughts and ideas, I think is just like unimaginable a few years ago, but now it's starting to become a reality. And I think that's so exciting. Um, and, you know, I you know, didn't ask you about your crewmates, but I read about every single one of, uh, you know, everyone who went on the flight and everyone's incredible in their own way with their own drive and mission and purpose in the industry, uh, whether it be through education or actually, uh, you know, in mechanical and engineering, uh, designing the actual flight you guys went on, which I thought was very exciting. So I'm I'm curious to hear how was the whole training process to go to the flight uh, to go to space and you know how was the experience with your other crewmates so it was uh, very positive uh, we had had a few zoom calls ahead of time just to see the faces and read each other's bios and things but when we actually went down to texas it was like uh, five days before the scheduled launch date that was the first time that we actually got to meet one another face to face and it was a, it was a great team as you mentioned completely different backgrounds, but we shared this interest in and love for space and the desire to do things. Uh, again, one of the women uh, was involved in a nonprofit to help inspire uh, kids and especially girls to get into STEM education and, and space things. Uh, another person taught uh, entrepreneurship at the University of North Carolina, and, and he was a uh, world traveler uh, had actually been to every country recognized by the United Nations himself wow. at the 193 countries. And so now he was <laughs> traveling to a new destination. That's so, amazing. Again, lots, lots of different backgrounds, but uh, got along really well. Um, we, actually, we had three full days of training itself. Um, it included um, some time in what they call the astronaut village, which was uh, really an old uh, ranch that had been converted. We had a nice dining hall there and a place to gather at the end of the day. Uh, they had a fire pit. Uh, we actually lived in little Airstream trailers that were well-equipped and each uh, person spent uh, the week in one of those. Um, and then when it was time for the training, uh, we were driven out to the astronaut training center where they had a more uh, high-tech type look in terms of the architecture and, and the furniture and so forth. Uh, they had a uh, classroom with, with desks and tables and <laughs> lots of pictures around the walls. And then this uh, mock-up of the capsule itself that we spent a lot of time in uh, practicing getting in and out of the capsule, both under one gravity conditions on earth and then what it would be like in microgravity to try to get yourself down and strapped in. And uh, it was pretty clever the way they had uh, arranged it. They had actually made a recording of all the sounds and all the noises on a previous flight with no people on board. And they actually played that while we were doing the, the simulations. And so they had it cranked all the way up. We actually had to wear hearing protection in the simulator because all the fans and the uh, avionics and the bangs and clangs and the engine running I mean, makes a lot of noise and so it was good to have the, the custom fitted earplugs in both in the training <laughs> and the actual flight so again um, three days of training it doesn't sound like a lot but remember this is a completely autonomous vehicle there's no pilot on board 
And so that eliminates the opportunity for uh, human error. And uh, we felt very well prepared and ready to go on the flight when it was launch day. Yeah, and I'm sure over, you know, as things get a little bit more, you know, like more efficient and we start learning more, uh, hopefully these trainings will become shorter and more accessible for everyone to be able to travel easily or just more easily to space. And you were mentioning, um, you know, about your other crew members, and I was reading how one of them is a Girl Scout, and actually on one of your suits, you guys had like a little trefoil or like a patch on your suits. And I'm curious, could you share a little bit more about this? Because I'm a Girl Scout myself. So again, this is a, the patch that we actually had for the, the mission and it has each of our names around the side along with uh, for the benefit of, of Earth. Uh, actually, the, the Blue Origin mission is, is pretty inspiring. Actually, it's um, millions of people living and working in space for the benefit of Earth. So that's the goal of the whole company and everybody from the engineers to the support staff and communications people know that and are working towards that. Uh, they make up a patch for each of the flights and, and try to incorporate some of the, the features or um, backgrounds of each of the people. And uh, you know whether it's uh, pointing to the, the different points on the map or some of the symbols that are uh, of special meaning to, to like Girl Scouts and those with that background. There was a, a small little circle that indicated orbits from my experience at the Orbital Sciences Corporation. And, and so lots of different uh, features that uh, if you know the whole story, then it can be a, a meaningful picture. Yeah, I know. I was really excited when I heard that. And just seeing that patch, I'm sure that's like a big memory and something you'll keep with you for the rest of your life. Absolutely. And yeah, and I know when I interviewed you last year, I asked uh, the similar, the same question, and I'm curious how your response has maybe changed or stayed the same. And my question for you again is, uh, what do you see, uh, what excites you and what makes you nervous for the future of the space industry? And how do you foresee the industry potentially changing? Okay, so let's start by, by saying how I think it's gonna change. I think going forward, we're gonna see more companies, more launches, more people having the chance to personally experience spaceflight, which, which is great. Uh, right now, today, there are 621 people from the whole world that have ever been to space. And I am honored and humbled to be one of them now. And so uh, that's exciting for me, but we need to get that number up <laughs> because this is something that more and more people need to be able to do. I see commercial space stations being developed and deployed, hopefully within just the next few years as the International Space Station gets to the end of its life. I see um, more spaceports being developed, both here in the United States and around the world. And I see point-to-point uh, -point transportation through space becoming uh, something that is uh, here and, and available for people. And so uh, all of those things are very exciting to me. Uh, in terms of concerns and, and what changes the government and, and the industry may need to make. I think the government and industry also need to work together to continue to improve what the regulatory framework is for uh, partnering between government, industry, and academia, and recognizing that the space is not just for governments anymore, but we need to have a regulatory framework. It needs to be as safe as possible, especially for people not involved in the flights. Uh, it's important to note that, that there's still risk involved and accidents are going to happen just like they happen for cars and trains and boats and planes. But we want the response to those accidents to be appropriate, not just, well, let's stop everything and say, never mind or, or start over. Uh, so we want to learn from that. And, and that will require, I think, us to do a better job of, of sharing information between companies and the government in terms of lessons learned and, and sharing the data when there is an accident or a mishap of some kind. And so that can really help the, the uh, industry to mature. And then uh, finally, I think there's an opportunity for us to do a better job of, of educating the general public in terms of what this space flight stuff is all about. And, what are its impacts like on the environment? Um, for example, uh, the way you design the vehicle matters. Uh, Blue Origin has designed this rocket to use hydrogen and oxygen as the propellants. So what's the byproduct of that? 
water vapor, water vapor. So yeah. I mean, that's good. Uh, some people are worried about, you know, well, where are you going to do these? Is that going to affect my access to the beach or is it a safety concern and so forth? Other people are concerned about pollution or noise or impact on astronomy, things like that. So I think there's a good story to be told, but we need to do a better job of communicating that so that people understand what are the benefits that can come from this activity and, and hopefully minimize the negative impacts on other industries and other people who are not directly involved. Uh, you mentioned some really great points there, and I definitely would have to echo the part about the educating the public, because a lot of times uh, people who are not directly in the space industry always seem to question uh, why we're spending so much money on space travel. Uh, and I think, you know, showing them how we can get so much technological advancements off of, uh, you know, this creativity that's happening in the space industry is so important and it directly is relevant in their own lives um, and the advancements we can make overall in like medicine not only just technology but understanding the human body better and doing experiments in space or in that microgravity environment so i think that very you know that really excites me and i'm you know glad that you're able to bring those different points up excellent points yeah. And, you know, what advice do you have for young students uh, regarding their pursuit of a passion of the STEM field, aerospace industry, really just any career? Um, I know I asked you this last year and you gave really great advice. And I'm curious after this year journey of, you know, have, you know, you, you, you've been to space, you've had this incredible journey in your life. And I'm sure the past year has uh, brought forth so many different changes in your life. So I'm curious, what advice would you give for young students to continue pursuing their dreams um, and passions in STEM? So that's a great question. Uh, during their training, uh, we, we heard uh, something that Jeff Bezos has said, which I thought was pretty interesting. And, and he said, you don't choose your passions, your passions choose you. And I, I think that may well be true, um, but it's important to recognize that, you know, if we do want to have millions of people living and working in space for the benefit of the earth, it's gonna take all kinds of people. And so space is not just for test pilots, engineers, scientists, doctors, and all the rest. We're gonna need mechanics, technicians, communications experts, cooks, writers, artists, musicians, athletes, vacation planners, hotel managers, all those kinds of professions. Yeah. So my observation would be, if you're passionate about space, there's gonna be a place for you, so keep at it. Yeah, that, that's an incredible thing. I love to think of space as its like own little world. And so every career you're going to need in the real world, you're going to need it's specifically the space industry. Um, you know, really, just like you were mentioning, any career uh, you could put together with space, and I'm sure there's something out there for you. Um, so really, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Neal, for sharing this experience of going to space. I can't uh, wait till more uh, people, more civilians are able to go to space, and it starts to become even more accessible to everyone. Um, so thank you for taking your time again to do part two of this interview and share your journey in space. Well, thank you for inviting me and I salute you for putting on this program. It's a great way to reach out and tell more people about space and how to get involved. Thank you so much.